And now, The Low Post. Welcome to The Low Post podcast on a Tuesday morning loaded with NBA games tonight. One of the headliners, Boston against Cleveland. The Cavaliers will be missing Donovan Mitchell, which is a little bit of an uh uh-oh with the PRP in his knee. Um, They have been uneven lately and have fallen to third behind the Bucks. But everybody is chasing the Boston Celtics who absolutely obliterated the Golden State Warriors in a national TV showcase game on Sunday. It was a national TV showcase half instead of a full game. They are nine games in the loss column ahead of anybody else in the Eastern Conference. Seven games in the loss column ahead of anybody else in the NBA. Essentially, the number one overall seed for them is locked up. They have a fun week coming up. Cleveland tonight. Denver in Denver in a rematch of one of the best and most taught games of the year. Denver's two-point win in Boston a couple months ago at Phoenix, who's kind of reeling a little bit right now with some injuries. And then after that, it gets a little easy until a couple of uh, a Milwaukee game. And then it was they see Milwaukee again at the end of the season. Boy, oh boy, Brian Scalabrini. I don't even know where to start with this team. I Actually, I do know where to start. You ready? Yeah, tell me. Their net rating for the season, they are now number one in offense by a lot. They have surpassed the Pacers and now just like opened up a a gap with the Pacers. And number two in defense, which is what I want to dig in with with you, plus 11.6 per 100 possessions. That is the best net rating, according to NBA.com, since the 1996-1997 Chicago Bulls who won the title. It is a hair above the 2016-2017 Golden State Warriors, which was the best of the Durant teams. Above that team is ridiculous. Um, On a margin of victory, uh, just simple points per game, they are plus 11.4 points a game. There have been 13 teams, including the Celtics team, with margins of victory per game of 10 or greater eight of the prior 12 went on to win the title the only exceptions are two teams from 2015-16 the Spurs and the Warriors the Cavs obviously won that year epic <clears throat> LeBron comeback against the 73 win Warriors the 2020 Milwaukee Bucks who flamed out in the bubble and the 71-72 Milwaukee Bucks um the Lakers won the title that year this is where we are with the Celtics and yeah. It's gone from anything short of a finals is a disaster for them to this team is so far and away the best team of the Tatum Brown era. And despite Denver surging and rounding into playoff form, and look, we know Denver's a better playoff team than a regular season team. We know Denver's got the best player in the world. We know Denver is to absolutely be feared. The numbers, the 11 game win streak, the eye test, the degree to which they are just serious and calculated and nasty tell you. This is the best team in the NBA. They were my pick to win the title before the season over Denver in the finals. And look, the numbers just are what they are. This team is the favorite to win the championship. And I think anything short of that will be disappointing. Yeah. So I think you have to, you have to look at uh, the defense, right? You look at the defensive side of the ball and they have, it's just a very unique team that every one of their guys can guard every one of those guys uh, guard their own individual way. You know, Derek White could hawk the ball and pressure the ball. Jalen Brown has entered into that, but he's big, strong, physical. Tatum does the same thing, and he can, you know, um, he guards guys with his size. You got guys at the rim like Porzingis. Al Horford has been always been a great defensive player, no matter where he's winning. He's been a big time winner, and I think the biggest thing is they're. See, a lot of people talk about feel for the game, and they talk about, oh, yeah, he could pass the ball. That's feel for the game. Oh, look at his ability to score is feel for the game. Well, we're getting into the era where there's so many good players that you have to have a defensive IQ as well. You have to know when to help, when not to help. You have to know when to rotate, when not to. If a guy is B, can you make that adjustment right there on the fly? It's not that you can't. It's not something that you could teach, even though I'm sure they do work on it. But it's it's a really hard defense to find weaknesses in. And if you watch the games, it's usually, like, I'll give you a guy, like SGA, super lanky, super attack downhill, 
with the rest of the team that spaces and attacks downhill and relentless at attacking downhill. Those teams can could give the Celtics some problems. But outside of those teams that just uh, relentlessly attack, I seem I think they seem to do a pretty good job over 48 minutes of finding, you know, what your weakness is offensively and let's exploit it. And I mean, when Brad Stevens puts his team together, he looks at the defensive side of the ball, but he also looks at spacing. He also looks at shooting. He also looks at ways to improve Brown and Tatum and give those guys more of an opportunity to go to work. And we're in a unique situation now where our two best players want to be known as great defensive players, want to be all defensive players. So when you have that and you have really high IQ players, that's like the situation that we're currently in right now. Um, This is the best defensive season of Jalen Brown's career. I'm not even sure it's close. Not even it's close. probably the best defensive season of Jason Tatum's career, although he's been a very high level defender for quite a while. And you mentioned feel. This is the most tactically sophisticated defense in the league, and that's what makes it a scary playoff defense. And the origins of it really start from two seasons ago when they made the finals and in the middle of the season snapped into a defensive juggernaut when they leaned more into we're going to play Rob off the ball as a rover against whoever your best shooter is. Yeah. And that that might be our base, but we can adjust from there. And now you mentioned Tatum and Brown, like they're the constants throughout this. And I think part of the, I don't know, want to say mistake, but part part of the maybe mistake people made in, in trying to project the Celtics before the season, I'm guilty of it as well, is sort of penning those two guys in as like finished products. This is what they are. And you forget because of how experienced they are and how many deep playoff runs they are. They're 26 and 27. Tatum just turned 26 years old. They're still getting better. And how that manifests is exactly what you talked about. When they need to make a read on the fly on defense or when Missoula who really pushes these guys. Joe Mazzulla is a tactically really smart and creative coach. He's like, you know what? We're going to change on the fly. We're going to put Luke Cornett over here and just mess with this team. We're going to change from switching this to not switching this. They all, they don't need a possession of like feeling it out to no. get that stuff right. And sometimes they can just make those adjustments on their own on the fly. And into that mix has plopped Drew Holiday, who has been one of the smartest, most versatile defenders in the NBA for more than 10, almost 15 years. Marcus Smart was such a player as well. Um, and Porzingis can replicate a lot of what Robert Williams does. And like, I just think, you know, we were we were um, previewing the Mavs game on Friday on TV. And I'm just sitting there and they said, what's an angle you want to dig into? And I just put myself in Jason Kidd's shoes. And I'm like, I'm thinking step one for me is like, where the hell is Porzingis going to be? Is he going to be on? Is he going to be on Derek Lively? Well, that means one thing. And then I said on TV, like, maybe he'll be on Josh Green, the the, the sort of least threatening offense player in their starting five. And Missoula was like, no, how about P.J. Washington? How about we put him on P.J. Washington? So, Luca, you've got to use P.J. Washington in pick and roll if you want to bring our big guy into it. And P.J. Washington, if you're going to roll, you're going to roll right into Derek Lively's territory, and it's going to get all cluttered. And by the way, as soon as you figure that one out, here's 14 other counters we're going to go to. I said all season long, Offense, we can nitpick that. Do they shoot too many threes? Do they not? I've done it. They've actually sort of become, they've had more games in their last 15 games or so where they're getting to the rim at, at a normal average-ish rate, whereas before that it was like they were never getting to them. So they've corrected that a bit. But I've said all year, defense should be their trump card. Defense is the thing that shows up every game. Defense is the thing that makes up for a bad night from three-point shooting range. And they are all in on defense. And like, it's it's... It's just really interesting to watch them for for a, a a guy who played in the league, a very sophisticated understanding of it, a junkie like you. It must be fun to just be like, what's what are they going to break out today? What are the matchups going to be today? What are the schemes going to be today? What are the counters going to be today? I, I think the biggest thing, Zach, is there's not like a drop off no matter who's on the floor. You would think, okay, I mean there is. If you dial into the numbers over the course of an 82 game season, I'm sure we're better with Porzingis on the floor than we are with Al Horford at the five, but. When Luke Cornett comes in, they have a like a defensive package for him. We have a defensive package for Porzingis. When Al Horford's on the floor, their defensive package is a little bit different for him. So I just think, I listen, 
uh, I think there are a lot of great coaches in the NBA, right? But I don't know if every great coach could come up with things on the fly and their and their players can execute it. So you have this like perfect combination of veterans and high IQ players, incredible size and versatility, where whatever Joe comes up with and he whatever Joe invents or whatever his his thought process is, like once one time Oklahoma City was running a play. And he put uh, Luke Cornett on like SGA for a possession. I'm like, what are you doing? Well, that play was supposed to be a pin and a flare. And he wanted Luke Cornett to be in the drop. So it all like he's looking at your play and he's doing different matchups because of it. You have to see the play unfold to understand why Joe does that. But this team picks things up on the fly and they and they and they and they totally accept whatever Joe Missoula gives them. We're going to put Drew Holiday in the corner against this guy. And there's a reason for that. We'll find out the reason when they run the play. But initially, you're like, what? What is up with this particular matchup? And also, remember, he he has different matchups that he uses in the fourth quarter where the team can go a whole game, play a certain way, and in the fourth quarter, like in that Mavs game, they, they mix something up defensively, and then all of a sudden what was working for the Mavs with Luka and that lively pick and roll stopped working. And in Derek White hit a three, a three, and a layup. And next thing you know, that thing is a 25-point game where the Dallas Mavericks actually played really good basketball that day. And they still won by 25. So we always talk about it on this show and with, I mean, on our post-game show about um, the Celtics. And they got about 25 different ways that they could beat you. They got about 10 different ways where they can bury you. And, and like we saw the other night against the Warriors. And honestly... They have maybe just two ways they can lose. Number one is fall too much in love with a three and have a bad game from three. And number two is their crunch time offense can get a little bit hero ball-y, but like we haven't even seen that lately, partly because they never play crunch time, but partly because, you know, they're attacking every possession with a purpose. Like even the ones that end with Tatum being like, you know what, I'm just going to dribble it myself into a step back. First of all, he's more likely to do that when they're just up by 20 and it's just fun time and yeah. Geno time. Yeah, yeah, and number yeah. two, a lot of those possessions, they've already run the thing that is designed to get him the matchup, which is like usually a two man game with Derek White. And you, I mean, like you just can't say enough about Derek White. Oh, man. This could go down as one of the all time great, like sub star trades in recent NBA history. I mean, he has become. He's just better than Marcus Smart, first of all. Like, and he's become so good. And like, we're not with like two seasons ago when they lost in the finals. He went through stretches in the playoffs where he got skittish as a shooter, and he would turn down open looks, and it would hurt their offense. He that's over. Like, he's an elite shooter. If you go under a screen, he's pulling. If you trail him over a screen and you're a little bit too far behind, he's pulling. And his combination of shooting, screening for Tatum on and off the ball, for Brown on and off the ball to get mismatches and playmaking in open space is absolutely perfect for this team. And, you know, I talked about Robert Williams and Marcus Smart and like in the big, big picture in the off season, they exchanged Time Lord and Smart for Porzingis and Holiday, which if you're optimistic about Time Lord and Smart's health, you could say that's about a wash defensively. And let's just say it's a wash defensively. This season it hasn't been because those guys haven't been healthy and Porzingis and Holiday have been outstanding. Even if it is a wash defensively, you've upgraded the shooting like 180 degrees at center and you've upgraded the shooting at guard, Holiday versus Smart. And I wonder what you think of this. And this is not a knock on Marcus Smart who was amazing for the Celtics for a long time. A lot has been made of Tatum and Brown the word sacrifice has been thrown around, particularly for Brown scoring averages down. Tatum is picking up some momentum in the MVP discourse, but is further behind than would be typical for the best player on a team that is so by far the best team in the NBA by regular season metrics. Denver, I see you. Um, And they both have bought in defensively to, to a new level. And I just wonder if part of that is because they know Everyone around us, when we give up the ball, 
there's no one else on the team who's going to kind of play with it and and hold it for too long. Everybody else on this team is going to make smart decisions, and and more of those possessions where we give it up early are going to end with it coming back to us. Smart was the only one who would like, wait, I'm part of the big three here. I'm going to like do my stuff. It's my turn to do my stuff. Actually, Brogdon was kind of like that too. Like it's Brogdon time yeah. off the bench. I wonder what you think of that. That's sort of a, a pet theory I've heard is to whatever degree the two stars have sacrificed, part of it is they know no one else on the team is going to kind of infringe on their territory, if that makes sense. Yeah, so that's exactly where I stand. And I love how people use words like chemistry, right? And I don't, I, I hate that word because I don't actually think it has anything to do with chemistry. I, I think it has to do with basketball. And here's the reason. So you have 103 possessions in a game, right? And if you go to last year's team, so Rob Williams was taking zero of those, right? He's not dribbling the ball up and making a play. Um, but look at look at last year's team. You have you have Marcus Smart, who historically has even demanded that he's the point guard and he wants to initiate the offense, right? You have Tatum, you had Brown, you have Derek White, who probably did make the most sacrifices because he never got the ball and never were was allowed to do anything. And when Brogdon came in a game for his 21, 22 minutes, it was like the Malcolm Brogdon show at the time, which I didn't actually have a problem with it. He won six man of the year. Yeah, he was good. He was good. Yeah, he was like, you know, it's, it's it's totally fine. So you take you take smart out. Let's let's use let's just use like the simple tray. I know trades are complicated, but let's just take it. Smart goes out and Holiday comes in, right? Holiday spins about 50% of the game in the low dunker. And I'm sure people on this podcast know what the low dunker is, right? And in the corner, which he's shooting 66%. Just letting the game come to him. Once in a while, the ball finds him. And once in a while, he'll come up and, 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 and like initiate the offense. But it does seem like it's just so much better balance. You had five guys for 100 possessions. And I think I always felt this way with Tatum and Brown. And I also feel this way about stars. And I think... It's so elementary to say some shots per game. I think that is that is so like uh, kind of checked out, lazy uh, being a reporter by saying this guy's shots per game are down. I don't. I've never been around a player that is ultimately concerned when you really talk to him about shots per game. I think it's more about possessions when I have the ball in my hand. I don't want to be the guy that stands around and does nothing. I don't want to be the guy that's just in the corner. So when that does happen and then you get the ball, I feel like that guy's going to shoot the ball. I haven't touched the ball in nine possessions, so let me shoot it. I think like if the ball is popping and everyone is touching it and Tatum is making a play and he's giving it up, I don't think that Tatum thinks, damn it, I should have shot that because I'm only getting 19 shots per game. Like, you just came off and threw Porzingis the lob. And if, if Porzingis goes and dunks it or you hit Sam Hauser in a corner and he shoots it, do you really think, and this just goes for everybody around the NBA, do you really think that that superstar player is upset that he passed the ball to somebody else? Hey, give me a break. If that's the case and you're intellectually dishonest about the NBA, stars want to have the ball. Stars want to make plays. Stars want to be able to get downhill. And when you put two on them, stars at that point want to throw a lob and look at their hand and be, or look at the goggles or whatever they do. Right. So I've never been <laughs> a guy that's been about shots. I've been about plays. And if you take a guy that's taking 18 of those plays away and another guy's taking, you know, 22 of those plays away, I want the ball in Tatum and Brown's hands. I want those guys initiating offense. I want them to feel like they're involved. And right now I think we have a perfect balance of that. And I give a lot of credit to Drew Holiday, because I feel like he's the one, like, like Zach, I coach AAU. I can never get a player to commit to the dunker. They all want to have the ball. They all want to be around the three. They all want the ball. But but I always tell a player, if you commit to my to the low dunker spot, because the spacing is better for me, if you commit to that spot, I'll, I'll play you in the game. I'll allow you to take a bad shot. I'll allow you to do a lot if you commit to that low dunker. So to me, Holiday working the low dunker, and I'm not going to ignore Derek White. He does the same thing. He works that low dunker as well. Because we have a big that stands outside and shoots threes, you can't have five guys on the perimeter any longer in the NBA. Five out doesn't work. 
for all the people that think five out works, it doesn't. It's not it's not sustainable because guys are too athletic. Guys read the game at such a high level. So Holiday makes the sacrifices. Derek White makes the sacrifices. Holiday, we rarely run a play for him to initiate offense, but everybody else is in this nice zone. And I give Drew Holiday the most credit for our offense being the best in the history of the NBA only because he's willing to make sacrifices for the rest of the guys, for the rest of the team, and maybe because he already has that chip in his back pocket and he just wants another one, or maybe because on April 1st, he's up for a $40, $50 million extension, whatever it is. But Holiday has been the guy, in my opinion, that has made the most sacrifice for this team, and I think that's why our offense has worked so well. I bet he's also hungry for a potential shot at revenge against the Bucks, no for, for making him the sacrificial lamb of the Dame trade, which by the way, I've said from the beginning, I would still do that trade for the Bucks. I would, I well, said it when can, they fired Adrian Griffin, like I, I stand by that. Can I ask you a follow up yes. to that? All right, Zach, you're running the Bucks. Now there's no disrespect to John Horst. I love the guy and I love the Milwaukee Bucks. They're a great organization, but don't you have to do your due diligence and say, I can't let him land in Boston. Well, that's that's the mystery that hasn't been solved yet is how hard did the Bucks try to make that a three-team trade on the spot so that they could have some say in where he went? Because that's that that's you can't undo that part from the Bucks no. perspective. Like you want Dame, you get Dame, and you have to live with the consequences. And this is the consequence. But on holiday, you know, he sacrificed so much that I've had people around the league from different teams say, hey, did the Celtics, like, overpay for Drew Holiday? Like, Brogdon, now, this was before all these guys got hurt. Like, yeah, Bro yeah. Brogdon, people thought he's worth another first. Time Lord, he could be the starting center for the Blazers, or he's worth another first. And yeah. then two firsts to Portland in addition. So, like, you could say the equivalent of four first-round picks. Like, if he's just going to do the stuff you're describing, stand in the dunker, stand in the corner, like, couldn't they have gotten – like someone who's not as good as Drew Holiday for a much lower price. And my response to that is, A, that person wouldn't have been as good as Drew Holiday. And you're trying to win the title. Those margins matter against elite right. teams. And there will be a playoff game, probably multiple playoff games, that the Celtics win because Drew Holiday scores 25 points, which these other guys that you could talk about as lower cost replacements for him can't do. You mentioned um, rhythm. And guys shooting when they get the ball because they felt like they haven't shot in a while. I just wanted to get like the Draymond Jalen Brown thing, uh, leaving him open oh. uh, was so was so interesting <laughs> because Jalen Brown found it disrespectful and on on a on a on a sort of like black and white level, it was kind of disrespectful. But I really don't think if you ask Draymond and you ask the Warriors, why did you do this? I really don't think it's because they think Jalen Brown's a bad three-point shooter who won't make them pay. I just think they're out of answers against Boston, and they're like, Correct. how can we f*** with this team's head? How about we just leave Jalen Brown open? Maybe he'll shoot like nine times in a row, miss most of them. Jason yeah. Tatum will be like, wait a second, I haven't shot in a while. Now I got to get mine, and everything gets out of whack. And it's really a tribute to the Celtics. Now, Porzingis didn't play that game, but really everything starts and ends for the Celtics on – we can play with where we put our opposing center on defense because you're going to have a player, whether it's a wing, a center, whoever, that we're not afraid to guard him with and have him rove as a rim protector. And you can't do that with your center against us because our best lineups, everyone can shoot threes and you're screwed. Now, we've seen teams try to put centers on Drew Holiday just here and there. I think Denver did it with Jokic. I think that might be something they see a little bit in the playoffs. But I didn't. I thought I just wonder, like when you saw that, I saw you in the stands watching that game. When you saw that, you're like, oh man, they're like drawn dead from the beginning of the game. This is gonna be funny. I thought I thought that could not be the game plan. So we we basically had a debate on the post game show, and even at halftime, Steve Kerr or Draymond Green, Zach, you pick. I don't know. Like, did it, 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 you can't tell me that they like. It, that's no way Steve Kerr came up with that. It has to be I Draymond think, Green. I think it's Draymond. I, look, this is, I have no intel. I haven't asked anybody. Yeah, either do I. Either it's do one I. game. I don't care. We're moving on. But I just know that Draymond has talked so much since those finals about yeah. his how his confrontation with Jalen Brown, whatever game that was in the finals, like turned the whole series. Yeah. Got in Jalen <laughs> Brown's head. Like I own the Celtics. 
And like Draymond is very good at making himself the protagonist of like everything that happens in the NBA. And I think that that would just be my my guess. But Steve is the coach. Like it's it's ultimately yeah. his job to say yes or no to that. But it was uh yeah, it was but, interesting. Can I, I I can I just follow up with it? Like it's poor, it was poor form to start the game like that. Jalen Brown has been the go-to guy for the Celtics at the start of the game, usually, you know. Um, but you know, remember last year, everyone was like uh Tatum was Tatum was bad in the finals two years ago. And Jalen Brown was amazing. You it don't like for people that don't know, the game plan was Draymond was a spy on Jason Tatum. Wherever Jason Tatum went, Draymond was there to catch him. And they left other people open. Remember in game one when the Celtics hit all those threes, the the game plan has always been, which I always laugh at people saying Tatum didn't play well in the finals. There's no player that will play well with a player getting pressure with Draymond Green sitting there in your lap because Draymond Green's that good of a defender. That was their plan in the finals. It worked against Tatum, and they just left other guys open throughout that finals, and it happened to get the Warriors a championship. So it's not out of left field, but at the start of the game when you get smoke like that, I mean, its score was 21-20, you know, uh, five min- or six minutes into that game. It was a. It, you're right. So I watched the game late because I had st- I had family stuff too, and I saw the score and I was like, "Oh my god, what happened to this game?" And I'm watching. I'm like, "It's actually kind of close. Like five minutes into the game, this is like a close game." Um, a couple of notes on Boston's defense: second in opposing free throw rate, fourth in defensive rebounding, and that's another way you see the buy-in, the gang rebounding yeah. from the star players coming back into the play to make sure they finish the play. Now they're dead last in forcing turnovers, but that's obviously on purpose. Also not on purpose, but like they've prioritized some, some things at the expense of other things, stay in position, force tough shots, get yeah, low, low free throw oh. rate. That's like, if you want to connect two stats, yes. Um, forcing turnovers and like low turnovers and low free throw rate, they go hand in hand. You don't want to put yourself out of position. You don't want to swipe down at the ball. When, when they commit a foul, they look over to the coach and and they say, my bad. Like, I've never seen that in the NBA, but that's a big thing for the Celtics is defending without fouling. And if you just look at their shots allowed, you know, there's a lot of – one of the hot analytic topics in the last 15 years has been, like, what control do defenses actually have over three-point shooting and opposing three-point shooting percentage? Maybe some, maybe none. Depends on, you know, your taste and – what you believe in but one thing you do control or at least the celtics control is where the threes come from so they're 27th in three-point rate allowed they allow the fourth most threes in the nba that seems bad 2024 giving up a lot of threes is bad well they're 29th they allow the second most above the break threes and the fifth fewest corner threes that's on purpose that's structuring your defense so that you make some rotations and not others and also they allow the third fewest shots at the rim. So their defense is like airtight right now. I think it's gotten a little less play than it should. I will end with this. You know, we got Denver, you get the Celtics got Denver, Cleveland, I think Phoenix coming up, a couple of Milwaukee games late in the season. Other than that, an easy schedule. Um, what are you looking for? Like, what are you watching as this team gears up for the playoffs? Is there an area where you want to see them like that's one last wrinkle to iron out? Mm-hmm. Is there a matchup in the playoffs that you're like when you watch these Bucks games, is there something like, oh, that that kind of scares me about this? I mean, obviously Giannis scares you, but Dame scares you. But is there something you're going to be watching in any of these games as they as they gear up with literally like nothing else to play for? Yeah, so um, not necessarily during the regular season, but I'll just give you like, and this is the NBA knows this, and um, maybe your listeners might not know this, right? It's it's a handsy group, like to. Celtics on offense, when they go against a really physical, handsy group, that like swipes down at the ball and right into your airspace, like tries to speed you up with an incredible shot blocking big, with great coaching where they 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 pre-rotate out to threes. So you're kind of left with player getting downhill and players moving the space. They have struggled with that in the past. Like that's uh Golden State Warriors in the finals where you know they're in Tatum's airspace, they're forcing him into Draymond Green. Uh, the Miami Heat, when they're running that 1-3 one, zone, one, three, one zone, and Max Struess is into their body, forcing them to bam out of Bayou. There have been times against Joel Embiid in the Sixers series last year where it's get into the airspace, force him to put the ball down on the floor, force him to speed up into Joel Embiid. And I would say the same thing the Denver Nuggets did this year to the Celtics in the fourth quarter. 
it, like you know, Michael Porter Jr. can't stay in front of anybody, but Michael Porter Jr. can get into the airspace and force you to Nikola Jokic. So, and he's huge. He's huge. Hey, from six behind. ten, six ten. Yeah. So, so that is the like the final straw. They've handled it really well this year, but that will that and that will always be the case. Like you can't do that against the great LeBron James back in the day. You can't do that against even James Harden back in the day. Like those guys pass on a different level. <laughs> like they're, they're the elite of the elite of the elite of ball of, 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 of passing playmakers. Right. But the Celtics historically in the past have struggled with that. This year seems different. Tatum and Brown, their assist rates are up much more shooting, much more spacing, much more preparation towards it. Or Zinga is simply, you know, them not guarding Robert Williams in the past, and now all of a sudden you have to account for Chris Stapp for Zingas. You know, the high pick and roll turns into a switch. Like, those are the things that have bothered the Celtics. I haven't seen it in a while. I haven't seen it since the Denver game. But, um, you know, I'll throw another one out there. We lost to the Minnesota Timberwolves, and the Minnesota Timberwolves flew in from Orlando on a back-to-back -back day of and gave us problems. And Rudy Gobert didn't even play. You know, like... That's a handy physical defensive group with some shot blocking presence at the rim, right? That is the quote unquote air quote here as Achilles heel that the Celtics have to address. But it doesn't seem like it'll be a factor this year, but it could be a factor if Philly, um, you think if Joel and B can get healthy or at Miami always, because Eric Spolster obviously knows this and he's done this every time he's played the Celtics for like the last whatever three, three years. So that could be the issue, but if they can handle that issue, I can't see a team beating them in, in any series, including Denver in the NBA Finals. Um, you mentioned switching and Porzingis posting up. I, I've said this before, but you know, his it's not just that he's become a better post up player; it's that his mentality in the post has changed. So against Dallas, they got a switch on a pick and roll. He got a small guy at the nail. And decided, you know what, I'm just going to shoot over him, 17-footer, and missed. And that shot stood out watching the game because he doesn't take that shot as much anymore. That was the default shot for him in mm -hmm. post-ups against Smalls before yeah. really the middle of last season. Now it's, let me burrow in and work some pivot moves and some step-throughs and get closer to the basket to the point that when he took that shot, I was like, oh, man, you don't see him do that as much anymore. And look, I agree with, like, We'll see. We'll see. You know, to me right now, as things stand in the East, Milwaukee is the only team that can push Boston as of today. I think the Knicks fully healthy could be a pain in the ass for them, a pain in the ass for anybody. But like, I just don't know if and when we're going to see that. Thank God Jalen Brunson appears to have gotten, yeah. you know, gotten a break and not suffered a real injury here, a serious injury anyway. <laughs> um the Cavs, it's just it's too soon. I don't really trust them. Donovan Mitchell's knee thing. We'll see where that goes. Let's assume it'll be fine. Still, no no playoff series wins for them. The Sixers, like, look, MB talked about it last week. He wants to come back and play when he's ready to play. Whenever that is, he's going to play, no matter what their seed is, no matter where they are. And by the way, this the four, five, six, seven, eight is like wide open right now. Yeah. In the, it could be anybody anywhere in any of those places between New York, Philly, Orlando, Miami, Indiana. I just like. If Joel Embiid is not in full, just what if he is? Let's just play because only you're right. You can say that about any team, but let's pretend that Miami gets it together. Let's pretend that everyone gets it together. So let's, let's if they're not, okay, they're not I'll, beating let's, Boston. Let's, let's pretend, pretend that. that everybody's playing their best basketball. Do you really think it's just the Knicks? It's more and than Milwaukee that. and Milwaukee no, and Milwaukee and Milwaukee. Milwaukee, yeah. Milwaukee. The way they're playing now is like, oh, okay. Philly just – Boston just beats them in every series. Now, it was close last year, and Philly probably should have closed it out in game six at home yeah. and didn't. But, yes, I can say that about any team with injuries. However, this specific team has the best player on the team and the guy who was, like, neck and neck with Jokic for best player in the league, injured currently right now sure. with an uncertain timetable. And coming back full blast in the playoffs is really, really hard to do. Miami – Look, man, if I'm the they're Celtics, good right now. Don't they're playing sleep on, well. They're, no, no, I will never. No, 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 I will never sleep on my Miami. Every time we talk about the Miami on TV, I start making the Jaws theme off camera. But if I'm if I'm Boston, I want Miami. Like yeah, if, I, if, if that's agree. where the chips fall, like yeah. it's time to just exercise that demon yeah. from last year.
And, you know, I, so that's where we are. Just what it, this is what the Celtics envisioned when, I mean, you know, they had opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to trade Jalen Brown for a veteran player, Paul George, Jimmy Butler, Kawhi Leonard, over and over and over again. Now, part of that was in some of those years, they had a more veteran centric team with Kyrie Irving and like, oh, is Gordon Hayward going to get healthy? We have Al Horford. So their timetable was a little, they were like operating almost on two timetables at the same time. Mm hmm. And they didn't do that. And the reason they didn't do that was we think we're good now. We're going to be good later. And we're going to be contenders for 10 or 12 years, which is a very hard thing to do. And when the Raptors won the title, it looked like Boston had really kind of maybe missed an opportunity to get super duper aggressive. What's happening now is a redemption of their inaction because they have been a contender basically this entire time. Two wins away from winning the title two years ago. And everyone just sort of scoffs at that. Like, oh, they didn't win yet. Well, yeah, they got close. I mean, the 29 other teams, well, 28 other teams would love to get close to winning a title. And now they're the favorites in the East. And it's just impossible to know, given Kawhi's injury issues. And, you know, like, do any are Jimmy are any of those guys bringing you the magical title that you don't have yet? I don't know, but I know they're in great shape right now. So you sound a little more fearful of, of some Eastern Conference teams. No, I mean, I'm not, but I just think like you have to factor in Joel Embiid. He's of course. Uh, he's he's a major cheat code. And Joel Embiid historically has ran out of gas. Well, he just I look injuries are one thing, like limping back and all that stuff. Players don't do that anymore. But if Joel Embiid is fresh and healthy, he didn't go on a stretch where he was 38 and 15 or something like that. Had a 50 ball, a 40 ball. Like he is a little bit of a cheat code in the playoffs. And the officials have given the big the benefit of the doubt, including Porzingis in, in post-up situations against guards, you know, uh, getting under their legs in their airspace. So I, I do think he's a cheat code. I do think that Miami is a factor. Um, I'm with you. They're, about all, the they're all factors. factors. I just Boston yeah. should beat all of these. Oh, teams. yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, I agree with that. I agree with that. And I'm like, I'm, I'm becoming – uh, more lukewarm to the idea that maybe Milwaukee could guard enough to to challenge Boston, but I'm actually not sure because to me Milwaukee is just too slow. Like they're just across the board. Like if like a lot of these teams, they have shot blocking bigs. They're extremely like big and versatile and athletic around them. Like they do have Brook Lopez and they have Giannis, but those you know they're they're just too slow to, in my opinion to beat the Boston Celtics. That's an interesting way to put it, speed, because Crowder's gotten slow. Dame's never been a super fast defender. Beasley's, like, fast but overmatched and undersized based on the assignments they give him. But, man, those two dudes around the basket, yeah, Giannis and Brooke, is yeah. is pretty fearsome. They've definitely hit a new gear under Doc and with Pat Beverly just messing things up all over the place. Um, I, just, I just know Giannis, Giannis is one of those guys who – like what you said about MB cheat code, like one yeah. of those guys where you see him on the opposite side of your, you facing him in a playoff series. It's like, all right, we got to saddle up. Like, this is going to be, this is going to be yeah. tough. All right. Brian Scalabrini, uh, just one of the best in the business analyzing the Celtics, Sirius XM radio, the whole thing. Appreciate your time. Enjoy scenic Cleveland and, uh, Hopefully the Celtics get it. Hopefully, and and you going to Denver with the team too? tonight? Yeah, fine tonight. So it should be uh, should be good. I'm excited. Thursday I night, like Denver. One, one of the Eagle. games of the year. Uh, it's going to be amazing. Watching Jokic is a. It's, sometimes I got to hit my cough button when I'm laughing at how he's making the NBA look silly. <laughs> I don't think you should hit the cough button. I know you got. I know you got a little hot water with Celtics fans a couple of years ago when Denver came to Boston and you were just cackling at all the stuff he was doing and people were like, "Why is our guy?" being so nice to somebody from the other team. You're like, because it's ridiculous. Like, the it, guy's it, just completely truly ridiculous. Is, it's truly All right. ridiculous. Ryan Scalabrini, <laughs> thank you, sir. You got it. All right, let's shift east to west, and particularly at the top of the west, and bring in ESPN's Chris Herring. How are you, sir? I'm good, Zach. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. So, it's getting a little interesting at the top of the west, Mr. Herring. About a week and a half ago, Minnesota had the inside track to the number one seed, and now... The Wolves squeaked one out against the Blazers last night after losing a nail biter at home to the Clippers over the weekend. Wolves are 43 and 19. Thunder, who you just wrote a wonderful piece about their unusual and yet lethally effective offense, uh, just lost to the Lakers last night on the second half of a back to back, a win the Lakers really needed to get. 
42 and 19. And the Nuggets. Hey, remember us? <laughs> Team that won the championship. Yeah, put us on national TVs to talk about us sometime. 42 and 19 have won six in a row. And if you look at playoffstatus.com, which is one of the projection systems I like, here are the current chances at the number one seed among these groups and home court throughout the Western Conference playoffs. Certainly not in the finals against the Celtics anyway. Um, the Wolves have a 33% chance at the number one seed. The Nuggets have a 33% chance at the number one seed. The Thunder have a 31% chance at the number one seed with the Clippers wow. having the remaining chances. This is going to be a wild race. The Thunder have lost two of their last three. Who cares? The Clippers have lost six of their last 11. So they're five and six in their last 11, including a disheartening loss on the road last night, back to back, but still against the Bucks without Giannis and without Chris Middleton and the Wolves. You know, they've lost two or three. Who cares? But a little up and down. They're still 18th in offense, 24th in crunch time offense. Um, and if I'm looking around at the West, Clippers kind of uneven. Thunder inexperienced. You know, it's getting tested a little bit recently, but not, not that big of a deal for them. Wolves offense still, eh, not sure I trust it. If I'm Denver, I'm feeling pretty good about you know, yeah, the competition is tougher this year, but I'm I'm still pretty confident we're the best team. And the other team, I mean, this is maybe not for this episode, but that I'm feeling really good about if as if I'm them is Sacramento has not played very well recently, blew a 20-something point lead to the Bulls last night, just an absolute disaster of a home loss. The Mavs have lost a couple straight. They'll be fine. Lakers and Warriors are what they are. Suns are going to be without Devin Booker. It looks like for a week or so, according to the athletic, in the middle of an absolutely hellacious schedule. If I'm the Pelicans, like, man, I feel pretty good that if we take care of business, we're going to be in the top six and not in the play in. But let's talk about the top of the West. Um, let's, can we start with Clippers? Sure. Since they played the Bucks last night, uh, the Bucks are now nine and seven under Doc Rivers with the fourth best defense in that stretch. Um, the Clippers in that five and six stretch are 22nd in offense and 21st in defense. Just kind of look a little eh. Now, Paul George right. missed a couple games and Russell Westbrook is out for a while with the hand fracture. And I think one of the sneaky things contributing to this mini swoon for the Clippers is that Russ kind of quietly was regressing into out of control Lakers net negative Russ after spending most of the season is like legit helpful off the bench guy Russ and so not only did Russ start to decline but now he's gone and in his place it's like more Bones Highland ugh. more Amir Coffee is all right he, no one's guarding him but he's okay and it's more that I keep going back to what Ty Lue said when they were struggling at first with Harden which is we can't walk around on offense I thought it was just so on point. And they've been walking around on offense more lately. They've lost that kind of juice where one one a hardened pick and roll flows into an ISO for Kawhi, flows into a pin down for Paul George. They've lost that kind of juice. And Russ, whatever you think of him, he's going to come into the game and jolt your ass into gear and get you out in transition and kind of get you moving. They just feel a little bit lifeless to me. And I can't tell if I should be concerned, but one thing, like whether you care or not, they're pretty much going to be locked into the number four seed. And so they would only have home court for one round. Maybe they don't care, but what's your, what's your Clippers? I don't want to say concern level, but what are you watching with the Clippers? Well, first off, it, it's funny. I was thinking about that. I figured you would ask something along the lines of like concern level with them because six out of 11, when they've been basically the hottest team in the league for a solid really month and a half, two months. You don't want to get, you don't want to jump off a cliff because of what they're doing. But at the same time, um, they really haven't looked great. And now you're dealing with the Westbrook part of it as well. Also of all the teams that are veteran that have the level of experience they do. If there are teams you don't trust, like the Clippers obviously come to mind because of their injuries, because of James Harden being the new guy that they added to this roster. I think that this stretch matters 
quite a bit for them, actually. I think that they need to figure some things out still. Part of what seemingly threw them off, at least if you were to go off of what they said in the locker room last night after that loss to the Bucks, was the fact that the Bucks threw zone at them. Basically, that their offense just came to a screeching halt. Where, what was it, a 15-0 run that they gave up? And they were scoring just fine and then just kind of stopped. Uh, Kawhi, I don't think, made a single basket at all in the fourth quarter. And so it was just kind of PG and James Harden. And frankly, what we've seen from this team this year is that when Harden has to get overly involved from a scoring standpoint, um, I think the stat that I saw in our uh, SIG group was something like they're four and four when he has to take more than 15 shots, but they're 32 and 15 when he takes fewer than that. Um, so it's it's a team where you, you know, it doesn't mean that you're losing every game when he is kind of your lead option, but also do you want him to be that when Kawhi is right there? So I I think, like you said, the, the most off-putting part of this was just that this is a game that you should be able to take. I know that the Bucks have been much, much better, that Doc has fundamentally changed this team uh, overnight, defensively, basically. Uh, and so they're playing tougher. But when you talk about walking the ball into certain sets, not having Russell Westbrook to speed that up, guess what sort of defense is really going to screw you over when you're playing slowly? It's a zone. And, you know, the fact that they couldn't, really break that um enough to hold on to that lead last night was was a little bit concerning to me they still need to work through certain situations they still need to work through certain lineups quite frankly because they played smaller yesterday to try to speed things up and still weren't really doing it enough so i'm am i overly concerned no but again if there's one team that really doesn't get the benefit of the doubt here we talk about the nuggets and their swoon last year okay they came back and won a championship and they're you know relative to everybody else with experience and everything else, the Nuggets are the team you're not concerned about. Uh, the Clippers, not overly concerned, but they don't get a, a pass from me either. Well, and the four seed, if that's indeed where they end up, the the punishment for sinking to that level after being, they were number one for like a day. They were the number one seed in the West. Mm -hmm. the punishment will depend on who gets the number one seed like i if i'm if i'm them i'm rooting for anybody but denver to get the number sure. one seed because denver's got the best player denver's had their number number for four years now with a couple of exceptions including one recent one recent clippers win um so we'll see what that four seed actually means for them and my inclination is to give them the benefit of the doubt in this sense they diagnosed very quickly why they were not playing well when Harden first got there. Right. And they have one of the best tactical coaches in the NBA who also will call out the stars and say, can you do this like effort, ugly, grimy stuff that you, I know that it's hard, but like the only way we can win is to do this stuff hard and to flow hard from one action to the other, actually get back on defense. Their transition defense has been bad. And even when they're like, kind of evenly matched up they're just in a haze right now not connecting body to body not finding the right matchup it happened a couple of times last night and it's a veteran team they've clearly taken their foot off the gas a little bit like if you look at the lineups they're playing i think they've had more lineups in the last week or two where it's just one of pg Kawhi, and harden on the floor even in the games where all three have been available instead of two or all three and there will be little to none of those minutes when the games actually matter in the playoffs. And they probably feel like we've proven it to ourselves how good we can mm -hmm. be. We know right. what to do. But, man, that rhythm and that pace can be sort of an ephemeral thing. Hard to recapture sometimes, but I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt because these are veteran guys who know how to recapture it. I just would like to see them look like the team that blitzed the league for two months sometime before – the playoffs start and sort of get that get that juice back get that blend of actions back get that one thing flowing into the other back because they have not looked uh very good and that zone you mentioned the zone last night i would describe their zone offense as unimaginative harden had a good game last night he's he hit 20 plus in four of his last six games two of those were without paul george so they needed his scoring he never gets to the rim anymore. Like a lot has been made of that, and it just can't be overstated. 19% of his shot attempts have come at the basket this season. That is a career low 
he's never been under 25% in any season before. In his prime, he was at 35, 40%. He just doesn't get to the rim anymore. And that game in Minnesota that they squeaked out, a Tice flop. He got fined for flopping. He took I away a, <laughs> a, a Wolves basket. That helped. A couple Norm Powell uh, uh, end of quarter threes helped. But they squeaked it out. Um, in that game, Harden was 0 for 10. Did not make a shot. Like, this is... They're not going to be able to afford that in the playoffs, even when everyone's healthy. They're going to need you to at least have a passable game. But I still, if I were ranking finals equity among the top four in the West, like who would I give the best chance at making the finals? I'm going Denver one. That was my preseason pick to make the finals. I'm sticking with it. Come hell or high water or injuries, I guess, hopefully none. And I'm going <laughs> Clipper. I'm going Clippers two over yeah. OKC in Minnesota. I'm still putting them at number two, despite the fact that they're going to be seated fourth. I I mean, I, I don't think anyone can argue with you over that. The the fact that the other two teams, I mean, I and we'll get to this, I'm sure, when we talk about OKC. It's the second youngest team in the league. They're almost the youngest team in the league. Um, we're watching now that the Lakers would be maybe not an ideal matchup for OKC, you know, if they were to meet them in the playoffs. So there's all sorts of questions there, even though you know, numbers wise, talent wise, OKC has enough to make a real run. And to the point where we necessarily shouldn't be surprised by it if they make a real run, but it's still really difficult. I won't say in the exact same way, but there was a reason that a lot of people were were cautious or didn't pick the Kings last year, despite the fact that they were a legitimate top three seed in the West when they were playing the Warriors you might have been able to swap out the Warriors for another team too. And and people still would have had that orientation. Um, you generally have to kind of prove it in the playoffs once or twice, uh, or at least be there. And uh, so no one's going to argue with you. I don't think too heavily over the idea that the Clippers have to be kind of second in that pecking where I think most people would probably say Denver should be first in light of the fact that they're hot right now, but also that they won the whole thing last year. I never came off that. And they do look like a different team coming out of the all-star break, a more serious yes. team that win. it's not, it doesn't even necessarily like flow through entire games, but that win against the Lakers in LA was a game in the second half where they're like, all right, it's time, time to get serious. Like this Rui on Jokic thing ain't going to work. Murray is on a heater. Obviously Porter didn't miss a shot. But when they're serious, there's just a – they just know what they want out of every possession. They know how to counter everything that you're doing. They play at their own pace, and Jokic can just get whatever he wants. If Jokic touches the ball, they are getting a good shot. Like just, And I, I wrote about this last week. Their transition game, which is not a huge part of what they do, was completely MIA for the first 45, 50 games of the season. Last 10 or 12 games, their transition efficiency is top five. Their transition frequency off of live rebounds is top five. And Jokic is getting them out and getting them on the move and getting them some easier buckets. That's one sort of tell that they're getting serious. The obvious tell is like what their bench lineups are, what their non-Jokic lineups are, how many starters are in the game. But let's talk about Oklahoma City, who lost to the Lakers last night. Uh, they are 42-19. and 19. The difference between them and the Kings, obviously – is that the Kings last season did not have the number one point differential in the conference um, and, right. and profile as a statistical juggernaut like these two guys do, like these like these guys do, rather. Um, you wrote about them uh, over the weekend. Uh, for people who may have missed the story on ESPN.com, why did you, wh you want to write about the Thunder and specifically what did you sort of learn about their offense that was interesting to you and interesting to you specifically as you look ahead to how is this team going to fare in the playoffs? Sure. Um, so I remember, and, and you know, we were talking about this a little bit before, um, you know, the SIG group, the stats and information group at ESPN um, sends us emails daily about just kind of, I won't say random stats, but just kind of like trending stats that, this team is doing this or over the last 20 games, this team has done this. So the Clippers were a team that came up really quickly as kind of the tide started to shift with James Harden, for instance, after that trade specifically, they had sent out an email a month and a half, two months ago about the fact that essentially the, the thunder had the best jump shooting percentage in the league, basically dating back like through the tracking era that they were neck and neck with the, the 73 win warriors. Um, which is saying something, obviously. That like uh, obviously yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I, you know, I, I, I asked them over the course of reporting the story and I said, so th- th- similar to the way that, you know, if the Pacers have the best offense in NBA history, is that just, you know, in terms of all the efficiencies we've ever seen that they're highest, or is that relative to the league average? And so they were clear with me and saying like, look, Oklahoma city relative to league average, isn't the best jump shooting team we've ever seen. That's still those warriors, but just looking at the percentage numbers and everything like that, they have the best jump shooting percentage in the league uh, of all time. Probably Uh, the tracking data only goes back so far, but that prompted me to kind of look into like, what else does this offense have? Obviously they're a great jump shooting team. If you look at some of the advanced numbers on it, they produce something like 23 wide open three point shots per game. Um, they're a, a, a drive and kick offense to the max. They've led the league in, in drives to the basket for each of the last four years. Shea is obviously the driving force in that, but they have a ton of spacing even more so than they did last year because of Chet. And so um, in light of that, I wanted to look at like, okay, so we have that comparison point to make, that they're a great jump shooting team. Um, you watch enough of their games, even last year, and you could tell Jalen Williams is a, a damn good player. Uh he was second, clearly to me, kind of in, in rookie of the year last year. And I think was that for virtually the whole year, as far as I was concerned. It was clearly someone that was not just, oh, he's good because he plays next to Shea or anything like that. This dude is ahead of the curve as far as he's only 22 years old. Um, Shea is only 25. I think he's the second best player on the team, which I, I don't know if that's a take or not, but like he is... I just couldn't be more excited about Jalen Williams. I am driving the Jalen Williams bandwagon. That dude he's going to be an all-star. Star. He's, a, he's a star. He's a star he's right gonna now. He's going to be an all-star very soon. Like, I mean, it, it would have been a little bit too soon this year, just in light of who was in the conversation and the numbers. But he, I mean, he, he, he it's weird. And I obviously mentioned this in my story of their big three is very clear right now. Like, they have a big three. I, I get what you're saying about whether it's a take or not, because there's Chet, obviously, I don't think you even really have to worry about rank ordering them at this point. You know, Not that you were, but but the fact that like these three should be around for a while. And what makes this group different is that those two can handle the ball. Um, I think one of the stats that I found in, in reporting it or just researching it out is that um, Jalen Williams has, I think, the best off the dribble jump shot percentage since Kevin Durant. Uh, okay. Basically over this tracking era that we've had the shot tracking era which is like a scary number and i think that's one of the differences and i remember this was the case with the warriors at one point too a few years ago is that we get so used to talking about them as just this three-point dynamo that they just beat you from three and you have no choice but to kind of surrender to that but also that golden state a couple years ago was the best mid-range shooting team and that they were hunting those shots because they realized okay you're going to close out on us so hard so clay is just going to take two dribbles in and, and hit a jumper OKC is not afraid of that. You you can't play drop against them um, because their shooters are good from everywhere. Chet, Shea, Jalen Williams. So from that standpoint, it, it's very similar to what Golden State did, where you couldn't play drop against them, that they you know, were going to bludgeon you if you did that. Oklahoma City has the best offense in the league against drop. Um, but I think the biggest comparison point, and this is what I really drew from in the story, Oklahoma City is looking to screen you by using their guards. Um, so they like to invert their offense in part, again, because they have shooting um, with with Chet. But that's kind of what Golden State did. They weren't reliant solely on pick and roll. And Oklahoma City, in the same way, is not reliant on pick and roll. I think they're one of the five bottom five teams as far as pick and roll frequency. Um, but they get more out of it than anybody else. They're the most efficient team when they go to pick and roll, but they don't use it that much because they would prefer to kind of break you down different ways. They get a lot of ISOs and they, they are the most efficient team in the league in ISOs too, because everything is so spaced out. And so it's just a really fascinating dynamic from that standpoint. And I would argue they might not ever win a championship, but when you talk about this team's life cycle, all the draft picks they have at their disposal, they might be ahead of kind of where Golden State was just as far as development. This is the first year that these three have played together because Chet missed last year. And so just from that standpoint, in terms of how quickly they're kind of dominating offensively, they're already a a top five defense. 
because of the impact that Chet has and stuff like that. They have problems to work out, and they're going to have to figure those out either this postseason or in the offseason, but they have the means to fix it. So that was the angle that I took with the story and um, and why I find them to be really fascinating, regardless of what happens this year. And it's why they're hard to game plan against. Um, you mentioned you, you can't play drop against them. One of the reasons you can't play drop against them is because their guards are screening for their other guards and like mm -hmm. a guard dropping back ain't going to do anything. Uh, you never know where the pick is coming from or what the screener is going to do or where he's going to be. And you can't drop if Chet screens for them for, for Shea, because Chet will just pop out for a three or right. he'll roll to the rim more. I, I'm, I like when he rolls to the rim and catches lobs, particularly from J dub. Um, and one of the counters that you've seen it in a few games here and there, but they're going to see it more in the playoffs that everyone is sort yeah. of waiting for how this team responds yeah. is when teams throw the kitchen sink at Shea, when they just blitz Shea and take the ball out of his hands. And that's harder to do when you don't know what they're actually going to do offensively. Like if there's a pick and roll, if it's going to happen, where's it going to come from? Is it going to be a guard? Is, is Shea going to be bothered by a guard? blitzing him who's his height and not like a seven foot center blitzing him and he's going to be perfectly fine slipping the ball to whoever screens for him now if it's Isaiah Joe it could be an open three if it's Holmgren it could be an open three or a roll to the rim if it's J-Dub or Dort they go into open space and they make plays the wild card is obviously Giddy where yeah. um, teams are going to put their centers on Giddy we've seen that a million times and the counter to that is either take Giddy off the floor or use him as the screener and let him make plays. And that's another reason that blitzing is easier said than done against them is because even if Giddy is off the ball and therefore, quote unquote, a problem to your spacing and his guy is not the blitzer, his guy, he's not the screener. So his guy's not blitzing the rotations that happen underneath the blitz. If the ball finds him, he's going to now be looking at a scrambled floor and an open lane to attack instead of, a stagnant floor and this big dude is just waiting for me in the paint. It's Draymond. It's the short roll situation yeah. basically. But even if he's off the ball, it's this, it's the same thing. He's going to find a scrambled defense, mm -hmm. but I do think, you know, the big three is the big three, how they sort out the other two rotation spots in big spots is going to be interesting. Dort has certainly shot well enough to merit the attention of defenses. We've seen teams dabble in putting their centers on him and Hayward Look, it's been seven games, and yeah. he had not played for quite a long time. He's been injured off and on for like five straight years, so you want to give him time. I was excited about the trade. I was excited about the fit. He has done essentially nothing for the Thunder. He has not scored more than eight points in any game. He has three zero-point performances and two two-point performances. He is shooting 25%. I think he's 7 of 28 total for the Thunder. Three of those baskets were in one game they got to get something out of him, like something. And, um, but look, I mean, I think their offense is going to sustain into the playoffs. Like, I don't, I don't think there's any sort of like, I don't think this is a paper tiger on either end of the floor. You mentioned the Lakers matchup. I, I think, you know, rebounding in size is just what it is. And that's a trade-off that they decided to make for now. Like yeah. we, we think our offense is so powerful and our rim protection is so powerful and our shot and in our, perimeter defense like Dort and J-Dub yeah. is as good of a wing one-two punch on defense almost as there is in the entire NBA like you would stack them up you would stack them up against Jalen Brown and Jason Taylor against anybody they're huge and they're unmovable and they're fast but rebounding and sort of traditional big man bang in size is a weakness for them but their strengths are just outrageously good and I'm still surprised by how many people are like, do you really think the Thunder could make the conference finals? Like that seems far fetched. I'm like, it, I don't really see why, why it does. I mean, mm -hmm. it's going to depend on matchups. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's the thing is that the, the West is going to be a gauntlet, but I don't, I mean, the other thing we need to be honest with about is honest about is, is the idea that if there are a few young teams in the playoffs at a time at the top of the conference, at some point, if it starts to happen repeatedly, we need to get used to the fact that one of these teams is going to be good enough to break through even without playoff experience at some point. Uh, I mean, a team that plays off, this is a team, maybe this is the better question. Like, would we be more surprised if they got knocked out in the first round 
or if they actually came out of the West relative to where they like statistically, they are more likely to be a team that comes out of the West. When you look at the fact that they are basically top five on either side of the ball, that is when you start talking about championship contenders, we can talk about, Oh, most championship teams are top 10 on either side. They're top five. Um, they don't have the experience. We get that. There's no way to really bolster that without going out at the trade deadline and just getting vets for the sake of getting vets. Hayward was an effort to do that on some level, like a meaningful guy that could actually take the spot of someone if they're not performing well enough. Josh Giddy. Um, So it's not me saying that I think that they're going to advance that far, but it's not crazy at all to think that they could realistically win a round or two. Uh, it could be a bad matchup for them. Like we were saying about the Lakers, that is a risk that you're willing to take. Also, let's keep in mind, and this, this was said, I'm not the first person to say it, um, it's really difficult to find guys that are great rebounders that play the sort of style that they play. Uh, Chet is actually probably one of the better guys you can have from the standpoint of like someone that shoots it as well as he does, but actually can try to hold his own at times from a rebounding standpoint or kind of get in there and stick his nose in there. Uh, Porzingis is going to be another one that comes to mind just because of how well he's doing with Boston, but it's not necessarily easy to just sure. And they got Biombo, um, you know, kind of picking him up, but obviously he's not someone that necessarily fits exactly with the style of offense they play. So it didn't stun me that they didn't address that more meaningfully. I I'm kind of glad to just hear them lean into the fact of this is who we are and this is the trade-off and we think it's a smart trade-off and, um, so I'm curious to see what happens. Nobody knows, but it's they're going to be a really hard team to take out, I would think, just because they're – I mean, you've got all NBA defenders, like Derek White, saying the whole league is kind of trying to figure out how to stop them. And That was I, in your piece, a, Derek White said, that, to be clear. Give yourself a little credit there. No, no, no. I mean, I, let's be honest. I, I, I got that quote from something that he would said to the media in general. But I still – I think that that's meaningful when you're looking at the a team that looks like a, a wrecking ball throughout the league when one of their best defenders is saying, we don't really know, and, and that they're starting to get the kitchen sink treatment that Chet Holmgren told me, you know, a, a couple months into the season, we started realizing that teams are just kind of almost like um, a shuffle or something with music where you're just kind of changing the song uh, every couple – minutes because essentially they don't know how to defend them and they they can't stick with what they're doing because that's not working so let's just try something else and he said yeah you you kind of as you're watching you kind of realize like they're they don't know how to stop us and you can kind of feel when that's the case that's a he, really he also he also said when you asked him how would you defend you guys you're like well he said like even if i had an answer i, I couldn't tell you and I picture him looking over his shoulder, like is Presti around? Is Presti, is, 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 how many, <laughs> how many, how many PR staffers are following me, eavesdropping on this? What can I actually say? I think there uh, was a PR staffer on the phone with them when, when we did the call. So from that standpoint, look, I wasn't expecting for much more than that when he answered the question. But he said, "Man, honest to goodness, like even I don't, I don't think I would know." And uh, you know, it's not his job to have to know that. You know, I imagine Mark Tegnell is not thinking that it would have to be his job either. He coaches them; he's not coaching against them, but. Uh, that's what they're going to, that's what any opponent that plays them is going to be up against is that, uh, they've got a lot of different ways to beat you and, and sure they could have an off shooting series. They could have a bad matchup. They, who knows what the Josh Giddy thing is going to look like at some point. I imagine he's still starting for them, by the way, it's not like he's just a guy that comes off the bench. If, and when you pull the plug on something like that, what does that look like? Um, do they see a, an immediate boost from just playing somebody different? Is Hayward the guy you would want to replace him with? And what if he's not playing well? What if Hayward gets hurt? There are a lot of questions, um, but I, I'm really, I'll put it this way. I was really excited to see the Kings. And you you brought up a great point from the standpoint of like, the Kings are not OKC. Like the Kings had all sorts of defensive issues, uh, still do. So, you know, OKC is not that team, but I was really excited just to see them in that atmosphere. And I think the Kings rose to that level, certainly De'Aaron Fox looked fantastic, even with a broken finger, basically. Uh, so I'm really excited to see OKC. I'm really excited to see either them, Minnesota, possibly as potentially a one seed. It's crazy to think about the fact that we're asking, like, can a team advance out of the first round, second round when they're a one seed? But having this combination of youth, but also skill and, and winning, um, they should be around for a while. Uh, you know, knock on wood from the standpoint of injuries and and hell, like, 
the last time OKC had a big three to speak of at this level, um, it just didn't last very long. So I'm, you know, and Chet spoke to that uh, a little bit. So I'm curious to see what happens with them because they're going to be, if, if they're taken out, they're going to be an interesting out, but they also might not get taken out in the first round or two. So we'll see. They are, um, they made the correct decision to not sacrifice spacing for size and rebounding. That was the correct decision to not go get, we got to get a set, a traditional center who can play alongside Chet. We're not going to do that. We're not going to change the way we play. We're not going to sacrifice our spacing. Let our strengths sing. Uh, the Kings just an absolutely disastrous loss last night to the Bulls and a boon for the Lakers who have two games coming up against the Kings and need to win on both to get at the Lakers and the Warriors just need to get out of nine and 10. By the way, just all around the Lakers. I just like Anthony Davis has been sensational the entire season. And looked so spry and healthy and fast last night in that game against the Thunder. Yeah. My Anthony Davis measuring stick is <clears throat> how aggressively is he eating up space? Like, teams are going to give him jump shots. Teams are going to drop off of him on the pick and roll and give him that pick and pop jumper. And when he's when he's on, when he's feeling good, he will pass up most of those jumpers and be like, oh, you're giving me five feet of space. How about I rev up into you, create contact, and get a shot at the rim? How about I use this as a runway to get an offensive rebound? And he was just like, like as, as in peak prime, healthy, like new Orleans, Anthony Davis level athleticism, eating up that space last night. And that whole discussion that we had every day on television about the Anthony yep. Davis roller coaster and why can't he score 25 every game? And Oh my God, can he be trusted? Like that's all gone. I was always like, it's ridiculous. He's the best defensive player on the Lakers. He was the best defensive player in the playoffs last year. How come we never talk about that? He has rendered that whole thing, at least for now, moot. And he's going to have a game in the playoffs, if the, or the play-in, let's say. He's going to have a game in the play-in or the playoffs where he scores 16 points on 4 of 11 shooting. And the whole narrative comes up again about this and that. And yeah, like the Lakers don't really have a great margin for error for him to score 15 points or 12 points or 18 points in a game. But just like remember what this dude is doing defensively every single second he's on the floor for a team that is not like overflowing with great defensive talent around him. And he has brought it every game this season on both ends of the floor and looks sensational. End of Anthony Davis discussion. You mentioned the um, the framing that I love about these teams at the top of the West, which is would you be more surprised by first round exit or finals run or less surprised by first round exit or whatever it is. And the sure. team that that's most fun with is Minnesota. Yeah. Um, I I don't know, man. Like, this offense just don't look good. Like, they, like I read the numbers earlier. Um, I don't trust them in crunch time. I've said all season, my number one concern about them is the decision-making of Ant and Cat in late games uh, with, mm -hmm. with blah spacing around them and go bare on the floor. It's not a knock really on those guys. Like Anthony Edwards is 22 or 23 years old. I don't think the timing on his reads out of the pick and roll is quite where it needs to be yet. And that's totally normal. He's an unbelievable player. Cat is just like the dumb fouls are still happening. The crazy drives to nowhere are still happening. And that's partly not his fault. It's partly baked into him playing power forward now. And like when he drives right. into the lane, there's bodies everywhere and he can get kind of wild in those situations. Um, and they look, they do really well, even in crunch time when they get him the ball on the move, when he like sets the ball screen for Ant and then comes off a flare screen from Gobert, catch, move, drive. Like they get good shots out of that, including in that game against the Clippers where they kind of fell apart a little bit in crunch time. But I, you know, look, defensively, they're number one with a bullet. They're going to bring it every game. They're huge. They're ferocious. They're really, really hard to score against. Monty Morris has been exactly what they've needed him to be off the yep. bench. And you knew he would be. You knew it. And they just, they had the seven-game homestand and, and five games in seven nights. So it's not surprising that they're kind of limping toward the finish line of that. They go on a road trip now coming up that is is really really stocked with good games um and then they have they have home games coming after that against denver and golden state and cleveland i think so the next 10 games right. are gonna be really interesting if you add if you frame that question for me 
would I be more surprised if the Minnesota Timberwolves mm. are in the finals or more surprised if the Minnesota Timberwolves as either the one, two, or three seed lose in the first round? I think I would say I'd be more surprised if they were in the finals. And again, yeah. it's going to be matchups. Like if you draw Phoenix and Phoenix is healthy in the first round, and by the way, Phoenix, we don't talk about them much because they just, we just haven't seen the team for more than 20 games. And we're not yeah. going to see that they're not going to, we're going to get to the end of the season and they're not going to have 40 games with Beal, Durant and Booker. We're just, they're just not going to get there. And so we kind of excuse it away and wipe it away. This is like a disaster unfolding in Phoenix. If this is a play in team, and they somehow don't get out of the play-in, the health is what it is. Like, it's a disaster. But if you draw them and they're healthy and those three dudes are clicking, that's a nightmare. If you draw the Mavs, that can be a nightmare. We'll talk about the, the, the 9 and 10 teams. We'll see Golden State and Lakers, what they look like. The Kings are kind of the the softest opponent, maybe, of that group. I don't, I just... I'm at the point where I just can't trust the Wolves' offense enough for, for me to pick them to make a long playoff run. I, I don't think that anything you're saying you can be that you know up in arms about even if you're a Wolves fan I mean think about what you said and what we were talking about a moment ago with Denver right from the standpoint of the way you can tell the Nuggets are ramping stuff up Jokic is making a point to kind of play with more pace they're making a point to play with more pace they're blowing teams away late in these games uh, I think Sig sent us a note about the fact that uh, each time they played the Lakers this year, the game has been really tight, and then they just kind of hit the afterburners in the last five, six minutes of the game. We're talking about the polar opposite with the Wolves. Um, I, I did not know this, but I was reading around on Twitter, and um, I think I saw, I can't remember whose tweet it was, that they had gone nine, was it nine quarters without a fast break point? This sounds like the most constipated offense of all time from that They standpoint. were last night against the remains of the Portland Trailblazers. And by the way, Portland is a tough watch right now. Um, yes. Uh, Michael Grady and Jim Peterson, the great Wolves broadcast team, were like counting down to the first Wolves fast break point with the anticipation of like, Ryan Seacrest on New Year's Eve counting down to midnight. Like, can we get can we get one fast break? Oh, they didn't count that one as a fast break point. I don't. Not great, it. Bob. Not great. I mean, and this is what we're talking about. When you're talking about playoff offense, you're talking about your base half court stuff, but you're also banking on the idea. Like, obviously, the game slows down. You are taking every easy basket you can get, which again is why what you reference with the Nuggets is meaningful. They know what that is. They've been in that position enough times where you need to ramp up everything at a certain point. Ideally, that's what you're doing as you get to the playoffs. Um, so for their offense to look like it's kind of stuck in the mud, not just when they could have runouts and and you know and, and turn teams over and run the ball out that way to avoid having to go into half court sets. But also at the end of games and and the crunch time stuff is not new, but it hasn't looked particularly appealing lately either. Um, and so I, you know, hopefully the Monty Morris move was one of my favorites during the trade deadline. It was not the biggest thing necessarily, but their backup point guard play had been rough this year. It, it had been pretty brutal. The numbers with Conley off the court were just not good. Uh, I thought they got Monty Morris for pretty relatively little. Um, all things considered. And he's a guy that he's not going to turn the ball over. I haven't looked in the last day or two, but I know at one point he was like, he had like a 21 to one assist to turnover ratio since he'd gotten there, which is just what he does. Um, he didn't have that much tread on the tires either this season because he had been hurt with Detroit. So I like that pickup for them. Um, I think part of what we, part of what stands out to me, uh, what you mentioned with Anthony Edwards and the pick and roll stuff, and the fact that he's not always the most comfortable, he's not necessarily making the right read, he's not making it quick enough. I've always kind of had this theory in my head, dating back to when I covered the Knicks and they had Carmelo Anthony and Amari Stoudemire, um, that because you had Stoudemire and Tyson Chandler on that team, whenever you've got two guys that really have to share pick and rolls, like Stat was a, was a pick and roll monster in Phoenix for all those years. Tyson Chandler developed into a really, really good pick and roll player's a great vertical spacer from that standpoint. But generally speaking, only one guy can really get those looks when you're on the floor and you've got Gobert on the court with Cat. You've also got Nas Reed off the bench. They've got a really good center rotation, even though I know Cat is a power forward now. From that standpoint, does it 
take away from the ability to develop chemistry sometimes with the guy that really would be ideal for Ant to develop that with. And Kat, he's not of, of the two other guys that we're talking about screening wise, he's not setting like absolutely solid screens a lot of the well, time. Well, and also, and also because he's the four, a lot of teams are going to line up their matchups to switch that play. And even if yes. it puts a smaller, a slightly smaller wing on Towns, live with Towns trying to back that dude down in traffic. Like right. you see a lot of teams switch the Ant Cat two man game. Right. And, and and we've also seen Cat, you know, to to be fair, like we've also seen him get over eager and go too fast. We've seen him bowl over those guys and get charging calls to the foul trouble stuff that you were talking about earlier. I know you were talking about probably defensive stuff at the time, but we've seen him foul out of games, out of important games before. And so it's it's a risk that you're willing to take defensively because you're thinking that Cat might misplay it. So to me, when we talk about their crunch time offense, those theoretically should be their two best. Those are their two best offensive players, but they're not. When you think about the 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 clear takeaway from basically any and every team that has a chance to win a championship, their two best offensive players have an incredible pick and roll rhythm. And that just isn't the case here. And so when you look at how could their crunch time numbers be this awful, I think that that's a lot of it, quite frankly, is that it, I mean, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But you think about a couple of years ago, we were talking about the Bucks and Middleton and Giannis and how good their game was, or obviously Murray and Jokic. I, that's just not what you have so far. And, and again, it's okay because of what you're saying from an age standpoint with, with Ant. Like, I don't know that you can expect that. He's grown by leaps and bounds. He's improved as a passer, uh, but maybe not quite enough to where they're a shoe in to get through the first round, even if they are the one seed. And I think that that's a tough pill to swallow, but it's reality for right now. Like, I, I just don't think their crunch time offense, um, the way they've looked on offense in general, is enough to feel confident in saying that they'll definitely get out of the first round. Like, they definitely. And by the way, that's all right. That's life in the Western Conference. Welcome to playoff pressure in the Western Conference. This team also has a want a playoff series together, or this nucleus says it want a playoff series together. So they have to prove it too. Now, this is a really good team. Their defense is going to be there every game. They're a pain in the ass. Their matchup issues that they've posed for Denver, I think that's a real thing. I don't think that it is pie in the sky. I don't think that's people making too much of a, an, uh, a sneaky competitive five-game first-round loss last season. I think it's a real thing. I think Denver feels a little uncomfortable against them in a way that they do not feel uncomfortable against pretty much any other team in They've the whole league. they got three games left against them for the rest I know, of the season. I know, all late I'm, in the season. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a real thing. And so, again, matchups are going to dictate everything. And by the way, Gobert... You mentioned, you know, look, they made a decision that cat cat at the five is what you want on offense, but we can't get anywhere defensively with cat at the five. We got to get someone else in here at the five, even if it hurts our offense. Gobert has been really good this whole year and better on offense than he's ever been. I mentioned Anthony Davis eating up space. When, Ro when Rudy Gobert, Rudy Gobert, as Perk would say, tries to eat up space in every year prior to this year, defense would be like, Oh, big fella, you want to put the ball on the floor and like try and do stuff? Like, all right, have, have at it. He's punishing teams now. He can put the ball on the floor, one dribble, and dunk in your face. He had Kawhi Leonard on him on a couple of matchups uh, when the Clippers went super small in Minnesota and tried to spread them out the way that they did to the Jazz when Gobert was there. And he dunked on Kawhi Leonard's face like once and almost got an and one another time against him. He's been great. Um, it's just had a again, great game last be, night too. It's he's been big for them. It's going to be, it's just going to be matchup, uh, matchup dependent. Uh, but I just need to see, you know, and you look, you mentioned like Ant's age and yeah, the, the timing on the reads isn't always there and that's totally normal. What's not normal is that they needed to accelerate his development because of what they traded for Gobert in the financial mm. crunch that they're facing in the off season. There isn't a lot of, tolerance built into this team for like growing pains in the playoffs. They need to win and they need to win now. And they may well win now. Let's talk about a team that is winning now and shift conferences to the team that beat the Clippers last night without Giannis, without Middleton. The Bucks are now nine and seven under Doc Rivers. They've won five games in a row. They are 17th on offense with him, fourth on defense. And I have now seen enough where I think their defensive improvement is real. 
schematically, intensity wise, personnel wise with Pat Beverly, I don't think they're going to be fourth, but I think their ceiling has nudged up on defense and they've corrected a lot of the problems in transition and even in the half court. Brooke has been unbelievable. Giannis is unbelievable. Those guys are always good. Um, and yeah, their offense is taking a step back. And yeah, they need Middleton and they need Middleton at close to peak form to have any hope of, of beating the Celtics in a playoff series. We get all that. But I think with the defense, if not fixed, then on the way to being good enough, they they have reestablished themselves as a team with a really, really high two-way ceiling. Like this offense is awesome. Dame exploded for 41 last night and looked like Damian Lillard. And by the way, everybody wants to 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 sort of like you know, he's been kind of by his standards a little bit out of the rhythm at times of the season. Sure. And every time every time he looks like he's finding a rhythm, like his two games prior to last night, he had 33 total points on nine of 32 shooting and they exploded for 41 last night. It's been a little up and down, but when he looks like Dame, they're really tough to beat. We've beaten to death the Dame Giannis pick and roll. And how boy would it be nice if they could get more out of that, more out of the Giannis Dame pick and roll, more out of the back screening actions where they're screening for each other off the ball, which I think Doc Rivers wants to lean into a little bit more as they gain rhythm. But he has great chemistry, Dame Lillard, with Brooke Lopez on the pick and roll. Like that's causing a ton of problems for defenses because they drop off Lopez and he's making enough shots that they're sending third defenders flying at him and he's doing his little Brooke Lopez super slow-mo drives to the rim <laughs> ball boom yeah ball boom ball boom lay up or making the extra pass um bobby portis has kind of found his game again and his nasty spirit his wide-eyed nasty spirit him and to pat me, bev on the same team yesterday it's like, a just... little it's it's a lot it's, <laughs> it's a lot I look pat bev like he's gonna yeah. do he's gonna do pat bev things he's gonna He's going to talk a lot about how he's the key to the team winning, and sometimes he's right and sometimes he's not so right. He's going to commit fouls 90 feet from the basket sometimes. But last night, man, he was disrupting every single person on the Clippers that he was guarding, like Kawhi, Paul George, Harden. Like He was knocking the ball out of people's hands. He was a pain in the ass. And they dared him to make threes. You know, They put Zubats on him. And and so they could guard Lopez with the wing. And he like he's been playing well offensively for them too. Right now, we'll see what the Knicks look like health-wise. I don't know what to make of them. Embiid is obviously a question mark. Right now, they're the biggest and maybe only threat to Boston in a playoff series to me. And the good news for the Bucs is not only is their ceiling kind of stabilizing, but they're nestled right in that two, three part of the bracket now ahead of Cleveland almost no shot that they fall out of the two, three side of the bracket. So they have two series before they get to Boston and a potentially Titanic showdown with them. I'm interested in what's going on with this team. I, I I like, I, I like a lot of what's happening. I want to see it against better competition. I need to see Middleton that could not be emphasized enough. Secondary ball handler, a pick and roll ball handler that Giannis really trusts and has chemistry with that works from different areas on the floor than Dame does, and that I think diversifies their offense. But I like what I'm seeing. What are you seeing? Well, I first off, I, I don't know how we could dislike it. Uh, there was so much made of the the Griffin Doc swap. Obviously, I mean their defense relatively quickly after that looked. And and first of all, like shout out to the coaches being able to do stuff on the fly. Uh, Ty Lue, as we talked about the Clippers earlier, kept emphasizing. I need like, give me like five, 10 games to figure this out with Harden. Doc has taken so much criticism. I'm not even going to get into whether it's fair or not. People feel how they feel about it. Uh, This was kind of his project was to, they were not realistically within range, no matter what their record was of being a a true contender with the way they were playing defense. Um, So he's kind of streamlined a lot of what they're doing. He's kind of gotten them to switch. What is it like? 20, 25% more than what they were doing per game and, and per possession, what have you. Uh, this is a team now that looks competent. I mean, Giannis was not out there last night and they were locking up the Clippers. Now, again, we talked about how the Clippers maybe made it a little bit too easy for them and how the Clippers are having their growing pains without Westbrook even out there. 
who's going to speed them up and, and play with pace. But to, to your point and what you were saying about Pat Bev, there was one play. If you remember the, the, the deep three that AJ Green had, the play that played in the of game with like three and a half let, minutes left in the game. Yeah. Right. The play that led into that was one where um, the Bucks were pressuring. And because of that, Harden threw the ball into the middle into uh, Kawhi. And Kawhi kind of tried to break some things down. And basically, Pat Bev stepped up just enough to give Brooke enough time to recover from when he'd stepped up. And in that little split second, it gave Brooke just enough time to get back and swat Kawhi from behind. And it's like those sorts of things. Part of it is having somebody that knows what it is to I mean Pat Bev has played on enough teams at this time at this point he knows what it is to kind of step in and just kind of know where to be defensively and it's never a bad thing to have a guy like that on the court when you're playing alongside Dame defensively uh that maybe there's enough offensive defensive balance there especially when you go zone especially when you're playing against a team but again that all was without Giannis and so then you plug Giannis into that you plug Middleton into that um they have a real chance if if they have those guys healthy, if this defensive uh, ascent really sticks. And I, I don't see why it shouldn't. Um, that was what was always holding them back. And that to that point about the Bucs, I, what I like about them, what I like about John Horst is that they don't get complacent. And, and again, I, I'm not a fan of coaches being fired. How many games was it? 35, 40, 50, whatever it was into their tenure. Like, I don't think anybody wants to see that. But what I appreciate about the Bucks is that they kind of tore it down a couple of years ago, obviously, too. Um, when they got Drew and they kind of overhauled the offense, they were trying Giannis out in the dunker spot. They decided that they were going to try to go at offensive rebounding differently, and kind of bring guys in from the corner. And they looked a mess for a lot of that season they got it together like two thirds, three quarters of the way through the season. And they won that title. And I, I, it's not necessarily about how it looks in the ugly parts. It's kind of, can you get it together by the end of the year? The same question you were asking about the Suns of like, will they have enough games together? Uh, and the bucks, I think, you know, Dame is part of that. This process was always going to be probably a little bit ugly. You knew your defense was going to look totally different swapping out drew and Dame. But as long as it can look coherent enough towards the end, especially on defense, especially when you're going to be playing a team like Boston, potentially, um, that's really what matters. You're probably going to have enough offense, but the question was always defense. So the fact that that is what has seen the, the massive improvement in the last month and a half, I I mean, you, it, it's, it's huge. And it, it reshapes the way the East looks, where you went from having one team that you know will and should be there when the conference finals happen to now – at this point, with all the other injury questions and the way Cleveland has kind of looked, to me, that this looks like the favorite to be the Eastern Conference Finals for right now, if the Bucs can keep this up. Well, again, health health is going to be paramount for the. I think the Knicks would be a very very dangerous team and just <clears throat> physical and tough and nasty. And they've they've played Boston <clears throat> pretty well. Boston's at a different level right now than the way they're playing. But again, we just don't like the the door not closing on Randall having surgery like they've kept that door a little cracked open is a little scary they just haven't been healthy thank god again brunson got escaped without a serious injury Man. it appears <laughs> um because that looked weird and it's then a... you know look I, the the race for four five six seven eight is wide open you never look past miami ever 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 you Especially got without playing right now the, yeah you, they're eight and two in their last 10 games the magic are eight and two in their last 10 games i, I don't really think they're going to be a threat to one of the top teams in the east but they're they're solid cleveland we got to monitor this donovan mitchell thing like they haven't been good without donovan mitchell they haven't even no. been very good with garland on the floor and mitchell off the floor they're only plus one for 100 possessions and like yeah it's prp it's routine whatever like a knee is a knee like i'm i'm gonna be i'm a little bit worried but we'll i'm not really I don't know. I guess I'm always a little bit worried when, when players have stuff like this happen. Um, but, and by the way, it's amazing how, how doc, like the bucks look already transition defense. You're seeing those old, like dating to the 2008 Celtics teams, like the jumbo double half court picks for Dame where Brooke and Giannis come up together and set like a monster yeah. screen at half court for him. You're seeing Brooke Lopez set screens at half court for Giannis to get him going downhill. These are all just like classic. And like, oh, there's Danilo Gallinari. Oh, my old buddy Danilo yes. Gallinari is here. It threw me off. Playing, yeah. playing in triple big lineups? Sure, why not? Yeah, like, it's just become a doc off. extravaganza already. Yeah. 
Yeah, but Dame called it out yesterday of just, you know, when we look at how he was able to get it going um, after a couple of off games. But it, it involves everybody else, especially when you look at how Portis had been playing for a while um, and the game he had last night. To be able to have two guys come up and try to take the ball out of your hands, force the ball out of your hands. We've watched teams try to do that with Harden. We've watched teams try to do it with Dame before. But in a game where Giannis isn't playing, that gets everybody else involved really early and kind of forces the Clippers to have to make a lot of decisions, to have to recover and everything like that. I just like the way they look right now. It's 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 early. It's just right after the break and everything. But this is what you had to have been hoping for when you made the swap again to take out Griffin and to implant Doc as this team's coach to have this kind of improvement. This is probably better than what I think you could have really imagined. Uh, I kind of scoffed at the Gallo thing. I just he, he looked immobile to me in both Washington and Detroit. He's been okay for Milwaukee. Like he's made shots. He he's been moving his feet all right on defense. The the best moment of last night's game is when he dunked on a putback yeah. and the collective astonishment from everybody on the Bucks bench and Gallo himself was just delightful. <laughs> like the wide eyed, like, oh, he could still do yeah. it. Um I was not aware that he could. I, I mean, it, it seemed like he was aware that he could based on that. So it was pretty cool to see. One quick uh, other bookkeeping note before we go. Scotty Barnes had surgery yesterday hand injury or wrist injury, whatever it is, hand injury, I think. We don't know the timetable. I'm just bookmarking, like, probably not going to come back this season. The Raptors are 12th in the East at 23 and 38. Um, The only interesting subplots there are, number one, the race for the 10th spot. It's not much of a race right now. Brooklyn is 24 and 37 in 11, three games behind Atlanta. Brooklyn lost to the Grizzlies last night, which is not easy to do. Um, although the Grizzlies play hard, uh, kudos. Um, and the other subplot is the Raptors have the seventh worst record in the league right now, and they owe a top six protected first round pick to the San Antonio Spurs via the Jakob Pertle trade. So the lottery will be interesting from that perspective. And it's also an interesting debate. Like, if you're the Raptors, you just want to get that obligation over with now and just give the pick away, give the give the number seven, eight pick, whatever it is away and just get the obligation over with or do you care about keeping it um by the way and and then a two-year 26 million dollar extension for kelly olenic i yeah. like that for the raptors i actually i i felt like a little bit alone i kind of liked that trade for the raptors people didn't really get it like why is this team that's taking a it. step back trading a first round pick for kelly olenic on an expiring deal and ochai Agbaji, who was a lottery pick not right. long ago very back end lottery pick I liked it, and I kind of like the needle that they're threading of like, yeah, we're revamping our team, we're getting younger, but we're not going to fall totally apart. I think this is a fair deal for Olenek. I just think, I said this before, he's just a stretch five who can make plays. It's just a handy guy to have around. It's a handy guy to have around young players, young ball handlers who are not necessarily known for their three-point shooting, and Scotty Barnes has been good this year. I liked that trade for the Raptors. Actually, like, Utah getting anything for Olenek, I think, was probably smart. If you're not going to resign yes. him, you got to get something. Throwing a Baji in there in exchange for what's going to be a low first round pick kind of hurts the value a little bit. I'm just so de- – I get why Utah did what it did. If you're going to get okay. Detroit's second round pick for Simone Fontecchio, you kind of have to do it. If you're not going to resign Kelly Olenek, you kind of have to trade him for something. It just – I really wanted someone to push – the old lions of the Western conference for the ninth and 10th spots. And I thought Utah could have hung in around 500 or a little bit higher. And now it's just, it's over. The the rockets have fallen apart. The jazz have fallen apart. And, but uh, any Raptors thoughts, we got to give our friends in Canada something. (laughs) Well, I mean, it's, it's always frustrating when you have, there's nothing more that I hate than young players getting hurt right at the end of a season, because whether or not they would have made the plan or whatever else, it was fun to watch those two guys that they just traded for develop chemistry alongside Scotty Barnes and and quickly and bear it. Um, You know, Scotty Barnes made his first all-star game. So from that standpoint, you just want to see those guys progress. Uh, Obviously now, even if you could bring them back in like the last week, I think it's just more important for him to, to recover. But 
I, I mean, I, Grady Dick has been playing really well lately, and and I think didn't you mention him in your in your ten things? Yeah, that where... was that's the really the only thing to be disappointed. Not the only thing. Obviously, I'm disappointed for Scotty Barnes's health in his hand, but there was something interesting starting to happen with Scotty Barnes, Emmanuel Clickley, Grady Dick, and R.J. Barrett, and figuring out different combinations and different ways to use all these players together. Grady Dick has been solid for them, moving her off the ball, making shots off the move. And R.J. Barrett, as someone who's like team R.J. Barrett is not bad and is actually good and his contract will be fine, <laughs> even I was surprised when I looked up his numbers with the Raptors. Like, I knew he was playing well. He's I've been watched good. the game. 21 points a game, six and Efficient. a half rebounds, four assists, 56% shooting, 41 and a half percent from three, 61% on twos. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, that's 25 games. I don't think he's going to keep that up, but he's been, he has, he has been way better than the, like, you got to take this guy attachment in the in the trade like he's been better than a net neutral player he's been legit good for them yeah i he is one of the players i'm most curious especially outside at least with scotty barnes out now like generally outside the playoff picture he's gonna be one of the guys i watch most closely because he's had these streaks maybe not quite this good i mean this might be the best he's ever played but he's had stretches and you know this i know this knicks fans know this all too well where he is great for 10, 15, maybe even 20 games. But then it's generally followed by like an equally bad stretch. And it's why his numbers have been kind of middling. He, he scores a lot, but he, you know, he takes, he's been one of those guys where he might score 20, but he took 17, 18 shots to get there, um, which isn't quite the efficiency you want to see. You don't want guys taking quite that many shots to get that number of points. So obviously anybody putting up these numbers would be great. I just want him to follow through this way for the rest of the season. And obviously with Scotty Barnes, not there, it wouldn't be stunning if he falls off a little bit just, or if he, even if Scotty was there, if he fell off just a little, because that's kind of what happens. Nobody kind of just has this, this level that they hit and never come down from, but consistency has always been the thing with him. I think it, this year he started really, really, really well and then came down and I felt like it shifted a little bit that probably was what nudged the Knicks into saying like, let's just go ahead and make this deal because you'd seen three years of it before that, where there's the ups and then there's the down that are basically equal in stature. So I, if he can keep up playing good basketball, I feel like that is such a big building block for them as they go into next year, as they get Scotty Barnes back. And as they see what they got from this trade and how these guys blend together. Um. And and the Barnes Barrett fit is by far the wonkiest fit, the trickiest fit, the yeah. one that is going to take the most reps to work out among all those young core guys um, that we mentioned. All right, Chris Herring, you got a piece about the Cavs that came up last week. Got a piece about the Thunder. What else should we be looking for from Chris Herring at ESPN.com? Oh man, uh, something possibly Knicks related. Maybe I'm not sure. It. it We'll, we'll see. I'm always working on something, but something supposed to be working on some Nick stuff, but we'll see. Chris Herring, thank you, sir. Always appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Zach. I appreciate it.